Right, welcome back to lectures. Um, initially, I had planned on covering non-parametric tests as well as categorical data analysis. Um, but as I was preparing the slides, I think maybe combining the two topics would be way too much. So we're just going to talk about non-parametric tests today. Um, and these really, we, we've covered them before, but only very brief, briefly um, when we were talking about our parametric tests. Um, and then we actually did conduct um, some non-parametric tests text in our exercises. And so, um, so I think this is, uh, you know, a good time um, to, to start talking about them in a little bit more detail. Um, and then hopefully at the very end, you know, I'll, I'll give a brief summary um, and it will sort of tie everything together. Um, all right. So what have we done so far? Um, and, and I'll just keep kind of doing this, you know, giving sort of mini reviews, um, you know, uh, throughout the lectures um, to hopefully start to kind of tie everything together. Um, so, so far we've talked about correlation. Um, so remember that's looking at the relationship between two continuous variables. Um, you know, one sort of qualitative way we can do that is to look at a scatter plot. Um, and then we can sort of quantify that relationship with a correlation coefficient. So if there's a linear relationship between the two, um, we can use Pearson's correlation. Um, if not, then we would use um, Spearman correlation or Kendall's tau. Um, we talked about linear regression, and if you remember, simple linear regression is the same thing um, as a Pearson's correlation. Um, and that, again, that's when you have a continuous outcome, um, and then you have a uh, continuous um, uh, predictor, and then that's when it would be equivalent to a Pearson's correlation. Um, in linear regression, you can also have categorical predictors as well. Um, we also talked about t-tests. There is a one sample uh, t-test, there's the independent two sample t-test, and then there's the dependent or paired um, t-test. And then uh, we kind of extended that to ANOVA. So a one-way ANOVA is basically an extension of the independent t-test. So when you have more than two groups, um, then we would use a one-way ANOVA. There's also an analysis of covariance or ANCOVA. And that, remember, is if you have a categorical um, factor or predictor and a continuous um, uh, covariate. Um, and then we have two-way ANOVA. So that's when you have two categorical factors um, and a continuous outcome. And you want to know the relationship between each of those two factors, so the main effect, of factor one and factor two, as well as the interaction between those two factors. So how those two factors are related to each other. Then we talked about repeated measures ANOVA. Um, and that's when you have, um, you have repeated measures within a single sample. So let's say you were measuring something over time in individuals, then we would want to use a repeated measures ANOVA. And that's sort of an extension of the paired t-test when you have more than two groups. Um, we also talked about two-way repeated measures ANOVA and then a mixed ANOVA when you have, um, so when we're talking about ANOVA, um, you know, we're talking about uh, you have just between subject um, factors of interest. So let's say we're comparing mean BMI for men and women and, um, sorry, so maybe three or more groups. So maybe white, black, and other, um, uh, and that would be between subject comparisons. Um, but if we have within subject comparisons uh, as well, so that would be when we use a repeated measures ANOVA. So we're looking at subjects over time. So those are that over time, that's a within subject factor because they're all, we're looking at all subjects over time. Um, but if you have a mixed ANOVA, then you have both a between subject factor and a within subject factor. So all of those are parametric tests. And what we're going to do today is talk about non-parametric tests. 
So when our data are not normally distributed or they don't meet the assumptions of our parametric tests, then we would conduct a non-parametric test. Um, so remember, the assumptions of fitting linear or parametric models are that the observations are independent of each other. Um, the exception is in the case of repeated measures. So again, if we're repeating, um, sorry, if we're measuring something over time in a group of individuals, um, though that would be considered repeated measures. So those aren't independent, right? They're correlated somehow um, because we're, we're measuring something within the same individual. Another assumption is that the data points must vary evenly. So again, that's the homogeneity of variance or homoscedasticity. And then there's a normality of re residuals. And remember the residual is the difference between the predicted value and the actual value, so the error. And we assume that those residuals are normally distributed. So what do we do if we don't meet the assumptions of those parametric tests. That's when we would conduct these non-parametric tests. So when and why we, we, we use these non-parametric tests is when we don't meet those assumptions. And here's just a list of different non-parametric tests that are commonly used. So the Mann-Whitney or the Wilcoxon rank sum test. And if you remember, we actually did, we use the Wilcoxon rank sum test um, in exercise two. There's also the Wilcoxon signed rank test, um, the Kruskal -Wall Wallace test, which um, we also used, um, and then Friedman's ANOVA. All of these tests are really based on ranking the data. So, um, so remember we talked about these tests not using the actual scores or values of our data, but instead ranking them and then conducting the test on those ranks, on those actual ranks. Um, what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about the interpretation of our results um, because it, the interpretation or the alternative hypothesis can vary for these tests depending on the distribution of our data and then how we might re report those results. So again, these non-parametric tests are used when the assumptions of parametric tests are not met. Um, it is not always possible to correct for problems with the distribution of a data set. So, you know, if we have non-normally distributed data, um, but we're able to transform that data to make it normal, um, you know, we might choose to do that and then still use a parametric test, but sometimes we're not able to do this. So in those cases, we would have to use a non-parametric test. And these non-parametric tests make fewer assumptions about the type of data um, that we're using, but there still are assumptions and they don't solve all problems. Um, a limitation of these tests is they tend to have less power and they're also not testing the same hypothesis. So they're not testing the same hypothesis as our parametric tests. So remember for our parametric tests, a lot of times the null hypothesis is that the means are equal across two or more groups. Um, so that's different. For the non-parametric tests, um, we'll discuss you know, what the null hypothesis is, and then what our alternative hypotheses are really depending on the distribution of the data. So the first non-parametric test that we'll talk about is the Wilcoxon rank sum test. It's also sometimes referred to as the Mann-Whitney U test. So this is just the non-parametric equivalent of the independent samples t-test. So remember, the ind independent samples t-test is when we're comparing a continuous outcome for two independent groups. So this um, rank sum test can be used to either test differences between two conditions in which um, different participants have been used. So they're independent samples and uh, we're um, we're comparing some continuous outcome. So the assumptions for this test are that we have a continuous um, or ordinal dependent variable or outcome. So ordinal just means that the data are ordered. So an example might be we have a um, seven category scale of, you know, strongly disagree to strongly agree, for example. So that would be considered ordinal. Um, we can use this test for ordinal outcomes as well. Um, there's still this um, 
independence of ob observations assumption. So, you know, the observations are in two independent groups. Um, the other assumption is that the distribution of scores for both groups being compared must be known. So do they or do they not have different shapes? Um, if the distribution of, of our two groups are different, then the Man whitney u or the rank sum test determines differences in the distributions of the two groups. If they're the same shape, then we can say that we're determining the difference in the medians of the two groups. So what do I mean by that? What do I mean by different distributions? Okay, so if you look at this top panel here, we have males and females um, overlapped with each other. And this is just some engagement score. Um, so they have the same shape and they have the same variation, variability. Um, they're just in a different location. So this, this is a case where they're identical. They completely overlap with each other. In this case, they have the same shape. They're just, uh, sh the women are just shifted over to the right. So they have a different location. Okay. In this instance, however, um, and, and here as well, they have different distributions. Um, and so when they have different distributions, um, our health, alternative hypothesis differs than when they have the same distribution. Okay, so maybe more specifically, the null hypothesis for the rank sum test is that the distribution of scores for the two groups are equal. And then the alternative hypothesis is that the distribution of the scores for the two groups are not equal. Um, or another way we can put this is that the mean ranks of the two groups are not equal. So remember, this isn't the mean, but the mean ranks. With different distributions, we're comparing the mean ranks in the two in the two different distributions. Okay. If we want to say that we're comparing the medians, or if we want to say in the alternative hypothesis the, that the medians of the two groups are not equal, then the distributions have to have the same shape. So this is just from that earlier um, slide where they have the same distribution. It's just that the women are shifted to the right. And so the median, you know, may or may not statistically be different. Visually, it looks different. And then the rank sum test would be testing whether there is a statistically significant difference in the medians between these two groups. Note that, note that the null hypothesis is the same whether or not the distributions are equal. So the null hypothesis isn't that the median of the two groups are equal. The null hypothesis is still the distribution of the scores for the two groups are equal. If the distributions are different, then the alternative hypothesis is that the distribution of the scores are not equal. If the distributions are the same, then the alternative hypothesis is that the medians of the two groups are not equal. So again, this test and all, all of the, a lot of the non-parametric tests are based on ranking of the data. So they rely on this principle of ranking the data for each group. So the lowest score is given a rank of one, the next highest score is given a rank of two and so on. And then tied ranks are given the same rank. So it's, and, and at that rank would just be the average of the potential ranks. So let's say um, the, you know, third and the fourth highest scores um, are ties, then we would give those two, um, two scores a rank of 3.5, right? So that's just the average between three and four. If we have an unequal group size, so one of our groups, let's say men is um, larger than the other group, um, women, then our test statistic is just the sum of the ranks in the group that contains the least people. So in this example, if the size, sample size of women is smaller, then we would take the rank, the sum of the ranks in that group. If we have an equal group size, then the test statistic is the value of the smaller summed rank. Um, so we add up the ranks for the two groups, and then we take the lowest of these sums, and that is our test statistic. So, and remember, the analysis is carried out on the ranks, not the actual data, not the actual values or the scores that we've observed. 
So what does this ranking look like? Okay, so let's say that we have um, a placebo group and a new drug, um, and we're looking at maybe the number of side effects. Um, and so in the placebo group, this individual had seven different side effects, five, six, four, and 12. And then the new drug group, so the experimental drug, um, this individual had three side effect, effects, six, four, two, and one. Okay, so we take the total sample and we just order them. So you can see we're starting with one side effect all the way to 12, and then we just rank them. So um, this, this lowest um, score gets the lowest rank. It gives the rank of one, um, two, three, and then so these two individuals are tied. So they get the average between four and five. They get a rank of 4.5. Okay, and then the next person is six. And then these two individuals are also tied. So they get the average rank between six and seven. So seven, I'm sorry, seven and eight. So 7.5 and then nine and then 10. So that's what we mean by ranking the data. And then we would run our tests on these ranks. Okay, so the next test that we'll talk about is the Wilcoxon signed rank. So it's different from the rank sum test. And this is really just um, analogous to the paired t-test. So we're comparing two sets of scores when these scores come from the same participants. So let's say we have a group of participants and we measure um, heart rate, um, resting heart rate before and after an exercise program. So that's a measure that, that's occurring in the same group of individuals, so it's paired data. Um, but if we don't meet the assumptions of the paired t-test, then we can use the Wilcoxon signed rank test. Just like the rank sum test, in order to be a test of medians, the distribution of the differences between the two related groups needs to be symmetrical in shape. So the null hypothesis for the signed rank test is that the median difference between the paired values is equal to zero. And then the alternative hypothesis is that the median difference between the paired values is not equal to zero. So this is very similar to our paired t-test, right? Where um, the mean difference is equal to zero is our null hypothesis. And the alternative is that the mean difference between the paired values is not equal to zero. So that's for the paired t-test. So it's very similar for the signed rank test. So an example where we might use a Wilcoxon signed rank test is, let's say a researcher wants to test a new formula for its sports drink, that improves running performance. So instead of a regular carbohydrate only drink, this new sports drink contains a new carbohydrate protein mixture. And the researcher would like to know whether this new carbohydrate protein drink um, leads to a difference in performance compared to the carbohydrate only sports drink. And so to do this, the researcher recruited 20 participants who each performed two trials in which they had to run as far as possible in two hours on a treadmill. Um, and then in one of the trials, they drank the carbohydrate only drink, so the old, older um, formulation of the drink. And then in the other trial, they drank the new carbohydrate protein drink. And then the order of the trials was counterbalanced and the distance they ran in both trials was recorded. So in that case, we have a continuous outcome. So the distance that was run um, it's paired data because all, all individuals um, participated in both trials. Um, and then it's a smaller sample size. And if the data don't meet the assumption um, of the paired t-test, so these times, let's say, are not normally distributed, then we would use the signed rank test. So the next test we'll talk about is the Kruskal-Wallis test, and we did use this test in exercise two. It's just the non-parametric counterpart of the one-way independent ANOVA. So remember, the one-way independent ANOVA is an, it's sort of an almost, you can think of it as like an extension of the independent t-test, which compares means for two groups. 
the one-way independent ANOVA is comparing means across three or more groups, so more than two groups. And the kruska wallace test is just the non-parametric um, alternative to the one-way ANOVA. So the theory is very similar to that of the rank sum test. It's based on ranked data. And in this case, the sum of the ranks for each group is denoted by a capital R, where I is used to denote the particular group. Once the sum of the ranks has been calculated for each group, then we can calculate our um, test statistic. And for the kruska wallace test, it's denoted by a capital H. And this is just the equation for that test statistic. Remember, R um, sub I is the sum of the ranks for each group. So let's say we're comparing um, white, black, and other. Um, then it would be the sum of the ranks for each of those um, groups, white, black, and other. N is the total sample size, so across all three of those groups. And then little n sub i is the sample size for a particular group. The null hypothesis for the kruska -Wallace, wallace test is that the distribution of scores for the two groups are equal. And then the alternative is that the distribution of the scores for the two, I'm sorry, <laughs> The three groups, um, I so I'll correct this um, before I post the slides, but this should be the three or more groups. So just the distribution of scores for the groups are equal. The distribution of scores for the groups are not equal. And then the another way of putting the alternative hypothesis, and again, ignore this too, is the mean ranks of the groups are not equal. So I apologize about that. This was a, like a copy and paste. Um, but so just ignore the two. Remember, the kruska wallace test is looking at three or more groups. Okay, so if the distributions of those groups, the values for whatever outcome you're looking at, for those three or more groups are different, then the kruska wallace test, similar to the rank sum test, is determining the difference in distributions of those groups. If they have the same shape, then again, like the rank sum test, we're determining a difference in medians of the three groups. So this is just really important in terms of how we interpret um, our results. So whether or not we're going to report that the distributions are different or the same, um, or I'm sorry, or that they're different, or whether we're going to report that the medians are different. Once we have our results, Typically, and this is really typical for a lot of statistical tests, we would report the test statistic, um, its degrees of freedom, and its p-value. If the p-value is statistically significant, then we can go ahead and conduct post hoc pairwise tests. Um, and for example, one it, we could use is the Dunn test, and it adjusts those p-values, um, you know, because we're we're making these multiple comparisons now. Um, and we also did that in exercise two. All right, the last non-parametric test that we're going to talk about today is the Friedman's ANOVA. So this is just analogous to the repeated measures ANOVA for um, you know, parametric data. This is a non-parametric alternative to that. So this is when we have more than two conditions and we have this, the same particip participants have been used in all conditions. So each case contributes several scores to the data. So like the paired t-test, we are looking at, for example, all individuals participating um, in a trial and we're comparing before and after, so two time points. The repeated measures ANOVA is comparing um, across three or more time points, for example. And the Friedman's ANOVA is just a non-parametric alternative to that, to the repeated measures ANOVA. So if we violated some assumptions of the parametric test, so the repeated measures ANOVA, then this test can be a useful way around that problem. So just like all of these other non-parametric tests, the Friedman's ANOVA is much the same um, in that it is based on ranked data. Um, and then again, once the sum of the ranks has been calculated for each group, 
then we can calculate our test statistic um, denoted as a capital F sub R. And this is just the equation for that. The hypotheses for Friedman's ANOVA is that, the, so the null hypothesis is the distribution of scores in each group is equal. And then our alternative hypothesis is that at least two group distributions differ. And then possibly with respect to location, if our distributions are the same. Um, so, sorry, if, so at least two of the distributions um, differ, um, and we can say possibly with respect to location um, or the median. Um, let's see. Okay, so in summary, when the data violate assumptions of parametric tests, we can sometimes find a non-parametric equivalent, and it's usually based on analyzing the ranked data. So we talked about the Wilcox and rank sum tests. That compares two independent groups of scores. It's, we can think about it as the non-parametric alternative to the independent t-test. We talked about the Wilcox and signed rank test, and that compares two dependent groups of scores. And we can think about the signed rank test um, sort of like um, the non-parametric alternative to a paired t-test. Um, and then we talked about the Kruskal-Wallis test. That compares more than two independent groups of scores. And we can think about the Kruskal-Wallis test as the non-parametric alternative to a one-way independent ANOVA. And then finally, we, we just talked about Friedman's test. And we can think of, of the Friedman's test as the non-parametric alternative to a repeated measures ANOVA. OK. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I will summarize these tests again at the start of lecture on Tuesday, and then I will save categorical data analysis um, as well as logistic regression. Um, so that's categorical data analysis for, from a regression modeling perspective. Um, we'll talk about that in the next lecture.